so that everyone can catch it. There's so many good things happening, so many sessions available that it's hard to pick one. So I know we appreciate the, everyone who's here. Um, and I, my name is Sam and I am the diversity and inclusion specialist at ECE in U, at USU. So at the Center for Teaching and Learning here. And I will let our presenter introduce themselves and introduce their topic as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Sam. I love it when I'm not alone in making the technology happen. So I appreciate your introduction. Um, my name is Karin de Jonga Kanan. I, uh, my subject is linguistics, which I teach at Utah State University, where I've been for over 20 years. I never thought I'd say that. Um, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint so that we can all see what's going on here. There we go. Um, so my title is very cheekily Rose by any other name. Um, of course, people's names are unique signifiers of who they are. And I wanted to take just a minute for some people to volunteer. Whatever it is they'd like the rest of us to know about their name, what does your name convey about your background, your identity, your community, maybe your culture, your heritage, your language, your religion? I'll take a couple volunteers here, just jump on in. Hey, Karen, it's Erin. Hi there. Um, uh... Well, my first name is an Irish name, um, but anyway, I just wanted to, I wanted to talk about my hyphenation, my Wadsworth Anderson. Um, I always, uh, well, not always, but after I got married and realized that um, my Anderson name would be going on my diplomas, I wanted to honor my parents. So I had to actually change my name with the Social Security office. So it is Aaron Wadsworth Anderson, uh, so that uh, my parents can be honored on those diplomas. I was only in Anderson for one semester of my undergraduate degree, so I, I really wanted to, to do that. That's a great story. I think we are both hyphenated women, so it's nice to find a, uh, a pal that way. Well, I might share kind of going off Erin's comments um, that I have a lot of family in Chile and it is common in Chile to take the father's first, the pe folks have two last names. So we would take the father's first last name and then the mother's first last name to have two last names. And moving to the United States has been um, interesting in terms of names because I don't have the same last name as my children. And so, um, people often cut off the second last name in school documents. And so my children are, their last name is often just reduced to Rivero. And so I, so there's a, a strange sense of relationship that people infer or don't infer between my family because of that lack of consistency with what might be more common in the United States. Mine is uh, kind of, uh, you know, I just started to realize the other day, mine is really generational. I, I think we're, with my kids, we're looking at uh, common names or popular names. And I, I kind of recognize that the, 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 the name Greg or Gregory is my real name, has not been a popular baby name for a very, very long time. So I remember growing up looking at older people with names like George and whatnot, I thought, well, those are names for older people. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, I'm becoming that person. My, my name has not been a young person's name for a very long time. And I thought, man, I am that all of a sudden. So I recognize there's, there's a meaning when, when I say my name to, to younger students, there now all of a sudden there's this other connotation that I'm this older person. And it, that just occurred to me the other day, I'll be 60 this summer. And that just occurred to me that there's a generational context, at least with, with my name and maybe many of yours as well. My name has a, an interesting cultural context in Utah in that Benjamin is one of the few names that is found in both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. 
And um, that leads to there being, especially I think <laughs> around BYU, an incredible number of Bens um, that you can get confused with. And because my last name is easily confused with last names of the same pronunciation or similar pronunciation, I often get like mail or my mail goes to people <laughs> who don't belong to or called um, for things that, that don't have to do with me at BYU. So it's, it's interesting the way it proliferates like that. I'll take one more story. This is Maureen. Um, my last name Andrade is my husband's last name and it's Portuguese. So I often have people ask me about that, but it's, it's just, I don't really identify with the last name. So it's always, I always say, well, yes, my husband's ancestors came from Portugal, but like, I don't really have a connection with it very much. So they associate me with something that's kind of not part of my, my own personal background. Oh, that, there are so many stories and layers of identity wrapped up in people's names. Thank you for volunteering these stories. Now with my next slide, I'm gonna ask for more stories. So if you haven't had a chance to share yet, this might be your chance. Share your experience around one of the following. Perhaps you have experienced people mispronouncing your name or maybe people misunderstanding the parts of your name like Sam has talked to us about or people asking if they can call you by an American name, whatever that means. Hi, uh, so Janowski is my husband's name and his um, uncle and aunt and cousins <coughs> is George just an hour away and they go by Gunowski instead of Janowski. Um, but when we were dating, I decided that Jennifer Janowski sounded better than Jennifer Gunowski. So I would always correct people. And that's how he's always gone by it too, is with the J sound. But then we got to our wedding and the person doing our wedding said Gunowski the whole time. <laughs> so I like, dang, I'd always correct people, but I wasn't gonna correct somebody in the middle of my wedding. <laughs> so I lived with it. <laughs> But I do still correct people because I, I like Jennifer Ganow Jennifer Janowski better than Jennifer Ganowski. <laughs> so. That's a great story. Yeah, that would feel awkward interrupting the person conducting your wedding ceremony. <laughs> I don't have a, a mispronunciation name, but I but I do now ask everyone to spell their name because when I mispronounced, when I misspelled Smith one time, I decided that I'd probably better ask that I don't know as much as I thought I knew about names. My last name is misspelled far more than it is spelled correctly if people do not ask how it's spelled. And even when people do ask how it's spelled, it's often misspelled just because people are very, very um, enculturated into a certain way of spelling Nielsen, or they think it's Nelson. Um, even if when they hear it spelled out, they still write it incorrectly. So even on a lot of, um, you know, official documentation and stuff, it's, it's misspelled very regularly. Um, so my name, my name is Maggie. And, but it's actually not my official name because I am from Taiwan. And my official name is actually Lin, L-Y-N, Zi, T-Z-U, and Xing, H-S-I-N. So it's very common like people don't know how to pronounce my name. And I think that's why that the third one is just like uh, people asking if they can call you by an American name. And that's why I have the nickname Maggie. And that's actually very common in Taiwan that almost like every kid, they, when they go to kindergarten, they will have a nickname in English. So it's easier for them to like, because sometimes um, Mandarin characters can be very confusing. So um, we always have an English nickname, 
but that's not my official name. And my name is uh, easily been mispronounced by a lot of people. So that's a really interesting experience for me. I wonder if you feel like perhaps there's different aspects of your identity in the foreground, depending on whether people are calling you by your Taiwanese name or calling you Maggie. Um, so a couple years ago, I was in Portland. And I think when people call me Maggie, I feel like I have to speak English. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, it, it def definitely feels like I have a different identity. It's like when people call me by Maggie, it's like, oh, I have to switch to my English mode. But when people call me in my Taiwanese name, it's like, oh, it feels like that's more me because Maggie's like a different identity to me. Like, oh, she's not Taiwanese. She's a girl who has to speak English to other people. I'm so glad you are in this meeting, Maggie. Thank you for joining and for sharing that story. Thank Anna, you. I thought, yeah, Anna, I thought I saw you unmute a second ago. Yes. Um, so, of course, people always mispronounce my last name, um, Dikama, and that's okay. But I feel like it would be perfectly fine if you don't know how to pronounce a name, just ask. You know, I do that with students too, because there are some Utah first names that I have no idea what to do with. Um, so I always say, hey, can you help me pronounce your name? So rather than me even trying, I always ask, can you give me some help here? And then I write it down phonetically so I know from there on out how to say it. And then another thing that happens to me is my E. So in my native language, my E is uh, audible because it's Anna, but then um, in English, it's Anne. So I lose my E, which is sad. Um, and then people just misspell my first name because of that, they just do the A-N-N. -N. But just like Anne of Green Gables, the book from Canada, she is also very particular about her E and so am I. <laughs> So most people pronounce my last name incorrectly as well. Um, they mostly say Andrade, uh, but they usually ask me, is that correct? And then I just say it's Andrade and they make the correction. Um, it doesn't bother me too much if it's mispronounced, but that's probably related to my first comment, which is I'm not all that connected to the name. <laughs> I don't know, I guess I should have kept my maiden name <laughs> because it just feels like it's associated with someone else and someone else's history and that kind of thing. That brings up the interesting notion of why do women feel compelled or have a desire to change their last name upon marriage, right? which is a whole different conversation. Yes. Marlene, I see your hand up. I was just gonna mention a little bit of a different perspective. I have a, a daughter and I remember how hard it was trying to choose a name for her um, because <laughs> there were two of us who had to agree on it and, and we wanted to be we wanted to choose a name that was easy to smell, but also one that was uh, uh, unique. And uh, anyway, it, it was it was hard to, as a parent, to know that you were giving a name to your child that would hopefully last for their whole life. And uh, anyway, it just made me really step back and think about how. Um, how significant that is. Also, I, I decided not to give her a middle name because when she got married, I didn't want her to have to make the decision about whether or not to drop her maiden name or middle name if she chose to take her husband's name. So anyway, that, that was something that was harder than I thought it would be choosing a name for my daughter. Thank you for sharing that story. It leads right into my next slide. 
Um, I'd like us to take a minute and look at this image here. This image of parents with a newborn. Try to imagine all the hopes and dreams and family connectedness that you want to capture with a name for a child. And I read this story or this um, study by Finch, who gave a sociological perspective on names and how they are chosen and what parents are thinking when they name a child. And Finch pointed out that parents are not just doing this on an individual basis or the nuclear family. This is a social act. Parents are social actors who signal social meaning in naming their child. And in doing so, the name they give is both a legal identifier and a personal and social identity. There's a lot wrapped up in a person's name, which then conveys to others both the individuality, so the uniqueness of the person and their group membership, their social membership. As instructors then, what do we do with students' names and why do we care? Why should we learn students' names and pronounce them correctly? You're the choir, so choir members chime in. <laughs> it feels, uh, makes a student feel like they belong and you actually care about them. For sure, for sure. I think you captured it in just one sentence right there. A study was done on law school students in Australia. So there, this was a program that admitted lots of students on a competitive basis, even after they were admitted, right? They're looking around this typical thing of, well, out of the three people sitting in your row, only one will make it to the second year of law school. So in that context, these uh, researchers, O'Brien and colleagues, talked about how students in law school feel about their names being used by their instructors. And they have some wonderful quotes, and I'm wondering if people can help me read these out loud since I don't have to do all of the talking. Who's gonna do this quote? I can read students. it for you. Oh, sorry, Shailen, you go ahead. <laughs> um, so the quote says, students' names are indicative of the richness they bring with them to class, representing their diversity, cultural heritage, family hopes, and dreams. Yeah, we already discussed that, right? And then this next quote, who's going to do that one? I can do that one, Karen. Thanks. A student's name is a powerful symbol. Using students' names recognizes their individual worth. And when I was reading this article, I was just cheering like, yes, yes, this jives with what I know. Even though I don't live in Australia and even though I don't teach at a law school, these are trends that ring true for me too. Who wants to read the last quote? Can you hear me, Karen? This is Denise. Yes. yes, thank you, Denise. Go for it. I finally figured out my computer. When a teacher engages students in conversation by name, a nonverbal message goes out that the student is respected and valued. And that just brought me to tears. Oh. Maybe we should sit with that for a moment. Thank you, Denise. Well, we've 
all heard about this book called Distracted. Some of us are going to receive it in the mail. We're all going to get an opportunity to hear the author speak at noon mountain time today. And I was so thrilled to find in this book a section also about names and what names have to do with learning. James Lang comes with a quote on page 107 where he refers to a study done in Italy on five-month-old infants, five-month-old infants. And he summarizes the research by saying, hearing their name caused infants to pay closer attention to what they were observing. And then, of course, he extrapolates this to hearing their name always primes humans for learning, right? So students in our classroom, if we call on them by name, we alert their attention. We can do this kind of as a classroom management style too, right? You see somebody off task and you say, so Susie, what's your opinion? And Susie snaps back to attention. So Susie is ready for learning when you say her name. Um, Lang also, because he's married to an elementary school teacher, uh, pulled in this particular part about names. He says, when children begin writing, one of the first things they learn to write is their name. So our earliest experiences of becoming literate are connected to our name. He says, Say, saying a student's name benefits their attention. So names matter. Names are connected to learning. I want to shift a little bit to what is a difficult name? And also, why do we get to make such judgments? Like difficult for who? Not for the person whose name it is. It's the sweetest sound in the world to them. And then why should we care about getting it right? Carmen, may I ask a question? Of course. So I, I make sure that I can pronounce students' names correctly. I ask them several times, but when I'm calling roll the first day, um, I don't like to mispronounce it. And so is it rude to say, sometimes I can say like, Ms. Smith, are you here? And you know, she's like, oh yeah, my name is, but sometimes I can't say the first or the last name. And so I say, okay, um, I, I, I try to say, you know this person's name and i spell out their first name can you please say your name is that a rude way to do it i just i don't want to mispronounce i hate when people mispronounce my name and so i don't want to mispronounce their names at the very beginning but i don't know how to elicit that from them all of what you're saying is totally valid we are so devoted to connecting well with our students from day one that of course we want to pronounce their name accurately but there are names with which we have no experience. There is help. I have been investigating all kinds of online help for getting people's names right there. And I have a handout that I'm going to um, somehow get to everyone that's in this session. So uh, if you don't get it, just email me. But there are apps uh, that offer pronunciation help. There is also an app where a person themselves can record their name and then always have that available to others. For example, as part of your email signature, um, that particular app can also be integrated with learning management systems. So I have asked Neil Legler if we can please integrate into our canvas this app for pronouncing names because students would pronounce their name once and it would always be part of the roster. It would be available to people who read names at graduation. It would be such a great move for equity and inclusion, I think. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be in the handout. And we know, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna address this question about what is a difficult name. And I'm thinking as soon as that question popped up, I'm thinking about a friend of my daughter's and her heritage language is Pushto. And there are sounds in that language that I are not in my heritage language. And so I have sat this poor child down so many times and just 
had her say her name and I repeat it. And as much as we go through this and as much as I really would like to pronounce it correctly, my mouth is just not, it doesn't. And so to me, I, that's when I think, what is a difficult name? I'm thinking of names that incorporate sounds that are unfamiliar to me. Um, and so I was really, I appreciate you saying that, of course, to the people who hold those names, those are very sacred sounds. And so, as Denise mentioned, there's this difficulty, right, of not have being well intentioned and wanting to do things in a way that best supports our students, but not always having the tools to do that in all cases. Can I make one other comment, um, as long as we're kind of stalled for a second? Um, we've talked all about names as positive things, but names also carry weight. And sometimes it's weight that students want to avoid or bypass. I went to school with a, a young man, uh, this is of course years ago, who desperately, desperately did not want people to use his name at all. And every year, he would go to the teachers and say, and tell them, do not call me by my name. And invariably it would come out and it was a source of embarrassment and concern to him. Uh, our, my oldest daughter, when she went to school the first time, the teacher said, what would you like to be called? And Anne Marie said, well, Rose. So she was, she was stretching. We have a, we have a whole series of, of, uh, um, LGBTQ students who are in the process of making all kinds of transitions. And so the idea of name, while there are positive connotations, also carries burdens with it that we can't escape either. So let's not all assume that even if we pronounce someone's name right, that that's something that they may, may not want to use. Oh, I'm so glad you make the distinction between legal name versus what a person prefers to be called. And, and I'm primarily addressing the, the side of what a person prefers to be called, but I totally get that there are names that people don't want us to use for them, for sure. Um, when we mispronounce names, are we aware that for some students, this has lasting effects? There are students who year after year after year have their, their teachers mispronounce their names. And in 2016, there were two articles prominent about this, that, uh, one in uh, sociology, the lasting effects of having a teacher mispronounce your name. And then there was one, the lasting impact of white teachers who mispronounce minority student names, because this is, of course, one of the big tragedies of education in the US. The, do you see what I circled there in red? This was referred to as linguistic bigotry. And I felt, oh, wow, that was a stab in the heart. And I probably needed it, right? Linguistic Ren, can I, bigotry. I'm so Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Um, I always thought that my name was pretty easy to pronounce. Um, and I've kind of found out that, you know, not a lot of people, they, they're they used to the, the boy spelling of Aaron with the A-A-R. Um, and when I was in elementary school, it was probably about the fifth grade. Um, there were two other Aaron's uh, boys, A-A-R-O-N, and then me. And my teacher just basically said, you know, I'm going to call you Erin, Erin, just because everyone else is Aaron. And it's one of those moments that sticks out to me in, in elementary school when you think about those moments, you know, and it, I just, I remember that and I didn't like it. And it, it, yeah, it was, it was always a, you know, and, and that's just a small portion of, you know, I mean, my name is relatively pronounced correctly, but I, it was just an interesting thing to me that my teacher just decided that's what she's going to call me. It doesn't matter what, what I think. She just decided. I'm sorry that happened to you. It probably led all kinds of classmates to call you by the wrong name, too. 
yeah it, it kind of opened the gate for urine as well oh man just five more minutes left Karen. all right all right all right um so there's a sad face and a happy face there right so so we can we have choices here if we can't be bothered to learn which is what this really is about right can we be bothered to learn can we put forth the effort Students feel invisible, unimportant, and othered, and research supports these findings, right? But if we make an effort, we end up in the happy face portion of our slide, and students will feel like we respect them, that we treat them with dignity and with care. What I wasn't aware of until I read uh, those articles about teachers mispronouncing their students' names for years and the lasting effects these are in fact known as microaggressions. And again, stab in my heart, right? I need to do better and I need to be better. But the good news is that I can. And so I would like your name learning strategies. And I also have a whole bunch listed, but I bet I don't have one of your very good ones. So I have a pen at the ready. I'm gonna add it to the handout so that when I mail it out to everyone, we can share. So real quick, your strategies. So I put in the chat, I use an info card at the beginning of every class. I ask what name they want. I also ask their hometown and what they like to do in their free time. So I can say, oh, Joe, you like to read. It helps me. Ben, you like to go to movies. That helps me learn their names. Beautiful. More light bulbs. I usually start off by telling people names are a, an issue. If I don't get yours right, it's not because you're, it's simply because I don't know and I'm relying on you to help me out here. Beautiful. I try to connect students' names and other people that I learn names with something familiar to me. So um, Karin, your name is one that I had never heard before. And so I remember when we um, start, first started interacting, this wasn't something I did, but that you taught me, you said something like, like, <laughs> like a car and you used the wheel. And, and for me that clicked. And that's what I try and do in other circumstances when I'm initially, I, I was not even aware I was mispronouncing your name and so I'm apologizing publicly for that um, but if I can connect it to something that is familiar to me it's going to help like even remember it so yeah. I've heard the actress uh, Saoirse Ronan do that too when she describes her name because her name is Irish and and the way it's spelled isn't, uh, you know, doesn't, the way it sounds doesn't look like the way it's spelled. And so she says, Sersha, like inertia. And Anna right. already gave us her strategy of uh, writing it phonetically on your roster, how students wish to be called. I encourage my students uh, to tell their name uh, before uh, saying something in the class uh, because I encourage all of uh, all of my students to know each other's name because I'm telling them you're taking this class together and I I, I want to see you as a family uh, so please learn each other's name not just me so I guess that's uh, that's the way I am learning their names as well Yes, I read this great strategy for roll call, which says you do roll call, you call the person's name, then the person responds by saying their name out loud, and then the rest of the class turns in the direction of the sound and repeats the name. And that's how you do roll call. And you can make it super fast once people are used to it. And I love that. You wouldn't have to do that for the remainder of the semester, because after about a couple of weeks, you would have it down pat. To go off of that idea, I, um, I tell my students on the first day of class that at some point in the semester, I will give them extra credit if they can name everyone in the class. And we have usually a small class because it's a writing class, but it's motivational for them because sometimes, you know, I tell them I want you to know each other's names, but why do they need to know it? And so then they're really, whenever I put them into group work or do different things, they want to make sure I know this person's name because at some point 
I will offer extra credit for them to be able to stand up and name all of their classmates. Splendid, thank you. Lots of strategies here. Um, here is my uh, colleague's email signature that reminded me that you can pre-record how you want your name pronounced. And I went to this website, it's called namecoach.com. You can do that for your own name or you can ask your students to do that and send you the link. Then you can listen to it lots of times without burdening them with having to repeat it for you all the time. Um, there's some reminders, trying is important. Keep practicing, mistakes are okay. Respond humbly to your mistakes. And remember it isn't about you, it's about the student or the colleague. Now here's my email. If I somehow don't end up with like an attendance of this session, like who all was here, I wanna be sure to get this handout to you that has lots of strategies that I found in the research literature and the apps and platforms you can use to help you in this endeavor. Well, with that, I'm gonna work, we've got to kind of close up a bit here. I, I put in the chat for everyone, I'll put two things. One is a feedback form so that we um, can get some feedback about how sessions are going. Um, I will also put the T4L, the Mighty Networks, where um, Karin, there you could put in your event, I believe you can upload files as well. So that might be a place that people can go to to find any extra um, information or resources from your presentation. So we thank you so much for that um, and everyone else for participating and sharing your stories. It's, it's so nice to hear everyone talk. So with that, we'll, we'll break for now. Karin, any last words? Just thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Keep learning. Yes, great. And so the next session start in at, um, 9:35. so hopefully i'll continue to see people around in the following sessions take care everyone thanks karen bye thanks for coming